9.00. Countdown. <laughs> Meanwhile, where is everyone? Everyone, pull out your cell phones. Thank you. Very good. Now, send one text to a friend who should be here. Tell them to wake up and come to class. Just one friend each. Okay? If you want to do a group text, fine. Um, all right, good morning. Uh, good Aidin. Uh, just to remind you, in case you weren't here on Monday, this person is me. Okay? Um, we have a grand total of eight lectures. We've done two so far on evolution and ecology. Um, this, and I didn't have this last time, so please, this is my office here on campus at Solange, just around the corner, actually. Sorry, just around that corner. Um, G001E. This building. This building, yes. Uh, I'm easy to find, so come find me, okay? Um, and I'm also always on the end of an email. Some of you already sent me emails about uh, the last lecture. Um, and I do respond to your emails, so please uh, be in touch. If you have questions, let me know. Um, okay, so last time we talked very generally about the theory of evolution, about what explains, about why it's such a powerful and important idea. And then we talked about population genetics. We talked about basically the fate of a new mutation, a mutation which appears in a genome, what happens to it? And obviously, as we saw, it depends upon the impact of that mutation upon what we call the fitness of the individual organism. If it enhances the individual organism, then it is swept by natural selection to 100% in the population if it's deleterious. And remember, most mutations are deleterious. You make a random change in a complex machine, you're going to screw it up. Okay, technical biological terms, screw it up. Okay? Um, uh, and that natural selection eliminates that mutation. Okay? Now that, that is how change occurs within species. We call that microevolution, microevolution. And it's sort of boring, right? I mean, just a, f a few changes within a species. Okay, so the blue-eyed allele in humans is increasing or decreasing. That's <coughs> microevolution, okay? What is interesting in evolution is the process whereby microevolution becomes macro evolution. In other words, it's not just a few mutations changing in frequency from generation to generation. It's a process that generates new species, new groups of organisms, whole new biological innovations. So that's what I'm going to be talking about first, is this process of speciation where one gene pool becomes two. Okay? And then the second half today, I'm going to be talking about revisiting the past. As I said on Monday, evolution happened in the past. The origin of life was 3.5 billion years ago. Okay? So we have to have tools in which to explore what happened in the past. And we have two particular tools. One is phylogenetic reconstruction, uh, which we talked about a little bit on Monday, and the other is the fossil record. But uh, to start with, Let's talk about speciation, which I'm calling evolution's diversity engine. Uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and I'll come back to this slide repeatedly, okay, so you know where I am. Um, let's do a thought experiment to start with. This was a thought experiment done by a famous evolutionary biologist. Let's say the process of speciation, speciation is generating a new species. Okay? Typically that involves splitting an existing species into two daughter species. Okay? So speciation would be if in this room a split occurred here and this became one species and this became another species. Okay? Let's imagine a world where that process did not occur. No speciation. Okay? So we have the origin of life 3.5 billion years ago. Natural selection is operating, right? So you've got an RNA molecule or whatever, and natural selection is improving that RNA molecule. It's becoming more complicated. 
it may be then eventually we're going to have DNA and we're going to have protein. We're going to have simple cells. But it's just one kind of cell. Right? So what would have happened is, yes, evolution would have occurred. Natural selection would have shaped this cell, this particular species of cell. But that would be it. The whole planet would be inhabited by a single, single-celled species of organism. The planet would be a really boring place. So the key thing, speciation is an absolutely key feature of the evolutionary process, what I've called life's diversity engine. So, first of thing, well, let's talk about species. It, before we to talk about the generation of species, we need to have a notion of what species are. The first point I want to make, and this is critical, is species are real. Some people might suggest that maybe humans, we look at the world and we, we, we go into a, a library and we look at different books and we want to put them in different categories. We want to put these books on this shelf, these books on that shelf, these books on this shelf. So in other words, we have to classify the books. Maybe when we look at nature, we want to, because we're humans, we want to classify nature. And it's not a natural thing, it's an artificially imposed thing by humans. That's not true. If we, if we go into, if you go outside and find some, the plants just outside this lecture hall, okay, and you measure some things, maybe how tall they are and how broad the leaves are, just two things, this is any two things, you will find they cluster. Now, so what is this? These are different species, cluster A and cluster B. And these are different individuals. So there is variation within a species. Look around you. Uh, but they're discrete clusters. So this could be, if we hadn't gone outside, this could be human beings and chimpanzees. They're discrete, okay? They're separate. So species are real. And what's more, they're the only real category, in, the only natural category in the taxonomic hierarchy. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's that you're all familiar with this idea of a taxonomic hierarchy. You have species at the lowest level, and you have multiple species in one genus, and you have multiple genera in one family, and you have multiple families in an order. Yeah? The key thing is species are real, where you draw the lines for, uh, say, a genus is essentially arbitrary. And let me show this. See the blue? So here we have four species in this blue genus. Okay? So, and that's maybe the decision of taxonomist one thinks, oops, sorry, I need to put in more, that all these, uh, the taxonomist one puts a, B, C, D, E, and F into one genus, okay, because he thinks they're sufficiently similar. Taxonomist 2 thinks A and B are sufficiently similar to each other and sufficiently different from C, D, E, and F that he's going to have two genera here. Both are correct, okay? This is an essentially arbitrary exercise, okay? But species are not arbitrary, okay? There's something very fundamental about the species as a unit, okay? So, okay, fine, so what is it? Um, Charles Darwin had this notion that species were merely an extension of the spectrum of variation we see within a species. So look, here you have a white rose and a red rose, so you've got varieties and you keep getting more and more different, and then you've got species. Okay, so it's a continuum. Now, we tend not to think of species in this way today. We see a discontinuity between the members of one group and the variation within it, and the members of another group. What is that discontinuity? What is that gap? between the spread of variation within a species, and then there's a gap and a jump, a discontinuity uh, to another species. Well, courtesy of this guy, 
1942, and I'm sorry about this, the sexual references. Um, I think this is a plastic snail. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Um, and these are anonymous pandas, as you can see. Um, the key thing here is that members of a species have the ability to exchange genes among themselves. Okay? All humans can exchange genes amongst themselves. We cannot exchange genes with chimpanzees. Okay, I hope. Okay. Um, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations that are, and this is the key term, reproductively isolated from other such groups. They cannot exchange genes with other groups. In other words, a species is a closed gene pool. Now, so, okay, nice idea. Thank you, Ernst Meyer. Let's just check this idea. It's called the biological species concept. It's not perfect, okay? And I'll tell you why. What about fossils? So, here are two fossil trilobites. Can they exchange genes? Well, no, they're rock, okay? But could they exchange genes way back when in the Silurian when they lived? We don't know. We can guess. Now, typically, we can do a pretty good guess. Why? Think about if we had fossil humans and fossil chimpanzees, very good specimens. Okay, so you can't put the human into a motel room with a chimpanzee and ask, are they going to have sex? Because they're rock, okay? But because they're reproductively isolated, because they're closed gene pools, because they've been evolving independently of each other, they look different, okay? So usually species are morphologically distinct. Okay, humans and chimpanzees are morphologically distinct, and these guys could be more. These look pretty similar, so we probably say they're in the same species. But it's a real problem applying the biological species concept to fossils. Another problem is it's all about sex, right? About the ability to reproduce. What about species that don't have sex? Okay, many microbes, as you know, are primarily asexual. Does that mean that we can't apply the biological species concept to them? Actually, no. Um, in general, even typically asexual microbial species will sometimes have sex. It's not exciting in the way that sex in mammals is. This is their idea of sex. You create this connection and exchange genetic. That might be enjoyable. I don't know. Um, it's difficult to tell. This guy's sort of got all hairy. Um, whoa! Do it again. Um, uh, so this is, this is sex in asexual species. So even asexual species will occasionally have sex, typically asexual species. Um, and needless to say, they will only have sex with individuals of the appropriate species. So even though it's much more difficult to apply the bi biological species concept to asexual species, you still can, and it turns out that microbes do the same thing. Okay? So we do see, in general, clustering of microbial species, species in the same way as we see clustering in non-microbial species. Okay, so we've got a reasonable definition of the species. It's not a perfect definition, but it's the one we're going to work with. Reproductively isolated groups. That puts an interesting emphasis on the acquisition of reproductive isolation. That's what speciation is. It's the acquisition of reproductive isolation. Okay, so if for whatever reason everyone on this room was happily into breeding but refused to breed with these guys for whatever reason, okay, this group is now reproductively isolated from this group, right? That's, that's, we now have two species, okay? Um, so what are barriers to reproduction? 
Um, we tend to divide them up into two categories. Um, the first is before the formation of a zygote. Uh, so in other words, uh, this is, there's no fertilization occurring. Okay? Um, and some of these might be, we, uh, we have a number of categories. Uh, ecological. Um, maybe you have two very closely related insects, one of which lives on plant A and one of which lives on plant B, and they never meet. They don't have sex. They're reproductively isolated because they're separated in space. Okay? So that's one simple example. You can be separated in time. Think of a flower. Now, you know this. Certain species of flower fl uh, come, produce flowers in May. Other species produce flowers in August. Okay? Remember, for, for flowers, this is sex for a plant. Okay? That's what a flower is all about. It's about producing pollen um, and depositing that sperm. Uh, sperm pollen are sperm, essentially, on another flower, okay? Um, so you have a flower that flowers in May and one that flowers in August. They're never going to have the opportunity to have sex, right? So they're reproductively isolated by time. Now, most of what we're familiar with is what you might call sexual behavioral isolation. So, look, imagine a chimpanzee walks in here. A, a beautiful female, young, sexy chimpanzee. And I'm standing here, okay? What's going to happen? Well, I'm going to be surprised, okay? <laughs> what are you doing at a Turkish university? Um, no, I mean, I have no, she has no sexual desire for me, and I have no sexual desire for her, I promise, okay? <laughs> okay? Um, because we're if you like, reproductively isolated from each other on behavioral grounds. So um, this is a typical human being, Madonna. As you see, there's not a lot of attraction going on. And this, by the way, this kind of behavioral isolation can be very subtle. So here are three species of these little insects called lacewings. Boring little insects. And if I was to show you the three species, you could not tell them apart. They look almost identical, okay? But these, this is a sonogram. So this is on the, uh, uh, for the three different species, okay? This is time, and this is the intensity of the sound that's being recorded. Now, so let's, this one goes Okay? This one goes well, you get the general idea. This one goes, ew, ew. Um, quite sexy, I think you'll agree. Um, but the point is, uh, this is just as effective at reproductive isolation for these guys as my lack of enthusiasm for the chimpanzee. Okay? And sometimes these mechanisms can be fantastic. This is a, a grebe a species of waterfowl uh, in the western United States. And this is pairing behavior, checking out the other species, I mean the other individual, to check that it's on board with you. And they have, birds in particular, have fantastic rituals. Fantastic? I mean, ridiculous, but fantastic. Anyway, you think dating is stressful. <laughs> Try doing that. Um, another prezygotic barrier to uh, Reproduction uh, is uh, what we'll call mechanical. 
Now that's kind of obvious, okay? Mating cannot occur. Um, here are the male genitalia of three very closely related species of Drosophila. Again, these are fruit flies. If I were to show you those three fruit flies, you couldn't tell them apart. They're identical, but they have very different male genitals and, and corresponding female genitals, which means essentially it's like a lock and key. So if a ma this male tries to have sex with a female that responds to this species, it won't work. Okay? Ouch. Right? Um, and you might say, okay, that's okay for insects, and it's a very common phenomenon in insects. Turns out that mammals also have some element of lock and key. Um, there is, in some mammals, a bone in the penis, um, which has a particular shape which the female is uh, interested in. Usually these are quite small. By the way, just in case all these guys are going, <laughs> we don't have one, okay? And if you do, you've got a problem, okay? Um, sometimes these are rather spectacular. This is from a walrus. Look at that. That is a penis bone. That's, look at this guy's face. He's impressed. Um, um, the uh, final form of prezygotic reproductive isolation I want to mention is what I'm going to call a biochemical or molecular lock and key. Okay? Um, here we are. This is a coral reef in the tropics. Most of these organisms, they're standing there, they're stuck there, so they're not, I mean, the fish obviously are mobile, but I'm talking about the inhabitants of the coral reef. What they're going to do is simply produce their gametes, their eggs and sperm, and throw them out into the water, okay? So there's no mate selection at the level of individuals. The m mate selection occurs in the water column between the gametes, okay? And if you have an egg of species A and a sperm of species A swimming around, bang, happy story. If you've got an egg of species B and a sperm of species A, even if they're close relatives, the sperm will come to the surface of the egg and be rejected because it doesn't have the molecular lock and key uh, to get into that egg, okay? So those are prezygotic barriers to reproduction. Um, they're also significant post-zygotic. So now, okay, none of these pre-zygotic barriers have applied. We've had sex. We've produced a zygote. What happens? Um, nice shirt. We've got a guy wearing a kind of evolution shirt. The elements of it. Elements of it. Um, uh, this is... Um, Post-zygote, this is a mule. Don't ignore the Tibetan guy, okay? Um, so yes, you've got fertilization, but often then if the two taxa, the two species are too different, development cannot occur. So you've got inviability. Sometimes if they're very closely related, and this is why I've got the mule up, you'll have hybrid sterility. So a mule, as you know, is sterile but it's the product of a mating between a donkey and a horse. So donkeys and horse are very close, so you can still get viable hybrids, but they're sterile, okay? Okay, fine, so the speciation is the acquisition of these reproductive isolating barriers, whether they're post-zygotic, i.e. some form of hybrid inviability or sterility, or prezygotic. How do they arise? Okay. Well, how does the actual process of speciation occur? Um, it's actually super, super simple. And this, this is the most important diagram I'm going to show you all the time in these lectures. This is the essence of the evolutionary process. Uh, here we have a population. And we're going to split it into two separate populations, okay? Some of these birds fly to a separate island. Now that population is separate from this population, okay? What will happen over time? 
Well, there are going to be mutations occurring in this population. There are going to be distinct mutations, right? Different from the mutations which are occurring in this mutation because the genome is huge. There are lots of different possible mutations. Okay? Now, what will happen to those mutations? Well, some of them will go to 100% frequency. Okay? Most of them won't, but some of them will. So as time goes by, mutations will occur on each of these lineages, and some, some small proportion of those will go to 100%, which means as time goes by, so these two populations become more and more different. Okay? It's that simple, folks. You separate two populations, and it is inevitable over time that they will become genetically ever more different from each other. And all speciation is, is the point at which you are sufficient, two populations are sufficiently different from each other that they are reproductively isolated from each other. Everyone with me? Absolutely simple, but key idea. NS102 is yawning, but understanding it. Yeah? Good. Um, look, we could do this experiment um, here and now, um, but let's just think about what's happening to each of these mutations. Remember, we've seen these processes. Um, a new mutation can, if it's deleterious, natural selection will remove it. If it's neutral, remember it's just going to drift, in which case it could drift to extinction or it could drift to 100%. If it's advantageous, it's going to be driven, this is a selective sweep, remember. Oops, sorry, let's go back again. Um, uh, what we're dealing with are these two separate processes which result in the fixation, in the going to 100% of the mutations which are arising separately. So look, if we would do an experiment, if I was going to, if I built a wall down this staircase, okay? We've got about the same number of people on this side, same number of people on this side, okay? So that is this situation at the moment. Now we build a wall, so we have two separate populations, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put lots of food in here, lots of food in here, maybe an internet connection, okay? And then leave you, you guys, and you guys, so maybe 10,000 generations, okay? You're going to breed. They're going to be little Turks running around. You guys are going to breed. They're going to be little Turks running around. And mutation's going to occur, okay? And so slowly over time, this population will become increasingly different from this population. It's inevitable, okay? Um, so... We've got this process occurring. What we can do after a certain amount of time is take, let's say, okay, okay we're going to take one female from here and a male from here um, and put them in separate, uh, and put them together. Can they still reproduce? If not enough time has elapsed, you haven't generated new species, and you break down the wall... You've got gene flow between, i.e. genetic connection between the two somewhat diverged populations. They're going to come back together again, okay? Because speciation hasn't occurred, okay? If, however, you wait longer, okay? If you wait, well, let's, let's do this. So after a short period of time, we take one individual from this population, a female, male from this population, and we put them in a motel room. Okay? What happens? Uh-oh. Looks like... Um, oh, dear, sorry. Um, looks like reproductive isolation has not been obtained. Let's run this experiment longer now. So more time and therefore more genetic difference. Same experiment, female from this population, male from this population, same motel, no baby. Okay, reproductive isolation has occurred. All speciation is, is a byproduct 
of genetic divergence between populations. Okay? It's that simple. So, given the fact that separation is so critical, it's natural that our models of the speciation process tend to incorporate geography. Because, say, if I've built a wall down here, that must be significant in terms of priming the genetic divergence process. So, most speciation is what we call allopatric speciation. Allopatric simply means you have geographically separated populations. Look, which makes sense. I've just geographically separated these two populations. There's no physical connection between them, which means they're evolving independently. The mutations which occur here are independently evolving in this population. The mutations which arise in this population are independently evolving in this population. Now, there are two general ways in which you can create allopatric populations. Allopatric simply means two physically, geographically separated populations. One is the way I've just described. We have a single continuous population and something happens. I build a wall down the middle. Sea level changes. So what was once a headland on an island, on a mainland, is now an island. Right? We call that a vicariance event. Okay? So something separates the single population into two. You can also have dispersal events. Sometimes this is called peripatric speciation. I apologize for the jargon. Um, this is where a few individuals from the main population disperse to a small peripheral population, maybe an island. Okay? So this here, the population has been split by an extrinsic factor. Here, the population has undergone a partial migratory event. Either way, the outcome is the same. You've got two populations in two different places. They are going to diverge. Now, this is a beautiful example of vicariance-driven uh, speciation. Um, where we are is this is the Caribbean, this is the Pacific, um, this is Central America. Okay, uh, so here's South America, here's Central America, so this is Panama here. Um, the key thing here is the Isthmus of Panama was formed about 3 million, 3.5 million years ago. Before that, North and Central America were separate from South America. Okay, which meant that if you were an organism living here in the Caribbean, you could swim over here and breed with conspecific members of your own species in the Pacific. Okay? But then three million years ago, bang! The barrier, just like the one I put down here, is formed. So there's no connection. Let's see what happens. So here's the... Um, this is when there were still water connections. Okay? So you can go between these. It's about four million years ago. These are species of a particular shrimp. And I've just, there's a whole bunch of different species. Each species is a different color. Okay? Now, we've fought three million years, three and a half million years ago, we've got this fixed. Okay? So we've got some, we've got the same species on either side. Okay? Now, what will happen? Well, they're going to diverge independently. So look, this is the family tree at this stage. Now, what? as time goes by, okay, you're going to get each of these original species is going to give rise to two descendant species, one in the Pacific, one in the Caribbean, one in the Pacific, one in the Caribbean, one in the Pacific, one in the Caribbean, okay? So, in other words, you've had single species bang the barrier, and each single species has produced two descendant species. Okay? Beautiful example. I'll tell you why it's a beautiful example. It's because we can, we can really understand the history of this process, because we can use geological data to actually put a date on when this separation occurred. Okay? Um, so that's a beautiful instance of speciation 
by vicarious, uh, vicariance. Now, that's obvious, that's trivial, that's simple. It, two populations, when they're allopatric, when they're in different places, will become genetically different and will ultimately become new species. What about sympatric speciation? Now, this is the opposite. This is in the same place. Same place, sympatric. Can sympatric speciation occur? Now, why, you say, why wouldn't it? Well, think about it. What I said was, with the geographically isolated population, we have a mutation here which increases in frequency in this population. It's not present in this population. This population has different mutations, right? That's how the two become different, okay? Now, remember what I said, if you've got a genetic connection, the mutation which arises here moves into this population by gene flow, by interbreeding between the two populations. So the two populations are the same. There's no differentiation. So sympatric speciation, almost by definition, is going to be more difficult, if you like, uh, to achieve. Um, so here's, you know, a geogra just a, a model. We've got a mixture of individuals, then within a single population, you're getting differentiation into two different types. Can that occur? And just to remind you again, in general, if you've got gene flow, that's going to prevent divergence between the populations. Well, one way that it can occur, and it's a slightly specialized case, but which is worth knowing about, is through weird events that change the chromosome number in species, okay? So this is something you're very familiar with. This is, you eat them. This is broccoli, we've got uh, cabbages and mustards and cauliflowers. They all belong to a genus called Brassica. Um, and what I want you to look at is these N numbers. This is the number of chromosomes uh, these species have. Uh, so they're diploid, or this is, uh, so these are the diploid numbers, 2N. Uh, so the haploid number is uh, 18 in this case. But this one has got 36 chromosomes, this has 20, this is 38, and so on and so forth. Um, and the way that has changed, we'll talk a little bit about on Monday, but it's r typically a very rare event, often through some kind of hybridization between two different groups, okay? And what you've done suddenly is you've created a species. It is a new species, basically instantly, because it's got a different set of chromosomes. It cannot there. Because it's got different chromosomes, it can't reproduce with the other ones. Okay? So this is, in a sense, instant sympatric speciation. Um, this is pretty rare. Um, it's except in plants. This is actually a rather amazing plot. This is the haploid number of chromosomes. Okay? And this is the number of species. Somebody has gone and counted the number of chromosomes in thousands of species of plants. Okay? And look. Many, uh, over a thousand species of plant have eight or seven or whatever uh, chromosomes. But what I want you to see is, look at this, coming down here. There's a peak on 14, there's a peak on 16, there's a peak on 18, there's a peak on 20, peak on 22, peak on 24. What's happening? Even numbers. Now, why would there be an overrepresentation of plant species with even number chromosomes? The way you get even numbers is by doubling something. Okay? Um, so that is what has happened, probably, historically, in these species. You've had genome doubling events creating new species, right? Because they have a different complement of chromosomes from everything else. And for various reasons, uh, these have be, this has been important in the evolution of plants. So that's one form of sympatric speciation. It's kind of a special case where you're getting changes in chromosome numbers, and it's happening probably pretty instantly with a very rare event, an error in meiosis or whatever. But what about sympatric speciation without something weird and chromosomal? 
happening. Well, yes, in principle, you can get it to happen. In principle, but it's gonna, it has a very strong special requirement, and it's this. Remember, if I've got two taxa, which are two populations which are diverging, and I have a connection, I have gene flow, the mutation that occurs in this population is spreading into this population, and the mutation which occurs in this population is spreading into this population, I'm going to get no divergence between the populations. So what we need is a second force, and it's got to be natural selection, and we call it disruptive natural selection, which is counteracting that gene flow. So how would that work? Let's take a simple example. Let's take this population take, has, a certain muta has a certain mutation. It's going to end up, and we have an individual breeding with an individual over here. Let's say their offspring is a disaster. Okay? The intermediate offspring is weak. Okay? Natural selection will remove that offspring. Okay? So natural selection is acting against the hybrids. Everyone with me? Yes, Dr. Berry, and we're awake. Good. Okay. Uh, acting against uh, the hybrids. Okay, so if natural selection is acting against the hybrids, so that's placing, uh, selecting pressure on you guys to mate with your own and you guys to mate with your own. In other words, you guys should avoid these guys, these guys should avoid these guys. Okay? But you have to have natural selection acting against the hybrids. Everyone understand? Okay? So natural selection has to counter the homogenizing effect of gene flow. Can this occur? Uh, sometimes, yes. And uh, this is an interesting case. This is a lake in West Africa, in the Cameroon. It's a very deep, simple lake. Um, and here's a bunch of fish that live in it. If we look at, and the details are completely unimportant. Um, you can't even read the names of the species. It does not matter. Um, but there are two family trees for the two different lakes. Let's just look at this family tree, okay? What you see is a single common ancestor which split into two here and here, then this common ancestor split into two again, this one split into, and so on and so forth. The point is you've got now one, two, three, five, eight, ten, eleven species of fish, all in this one lake, all very closely related to each other, and all descended from a single common ancestor. In other words, each splitting here is a speciation event. We've had multiple speciation events in this lake. Now, it's, they're fish, okay? They're capable of swimming around all over the lake, okay? So if you're a fish, okay? You're a fish, okay? You can swim, well, okay, maybe I should have chosen a female, but you can swim and have sex or whatever, right, to each other. Right? There is the potential for gene flow throughout this lake. So the fact you've had speciation, despite the clear possibility of gene flow, argues that you have strong natural selection supporting sympatric speciation. Everyone with me? So even though we think that most speciation is allopatric, because that's a simple way, there's no connection, so it's inevitable, probably also in some situations it can occur sympatrically. Um, and I just want to finish this uh, section on speciation by talking about a specific role of natural selection uh, in kind of the way I've just described uh, there's a term, we call it reinforcement, and it's this. Let, well, let's do, a, let's do an experiment. Um, let's split down here, and after 10,000 generations, we're going to bring you back together again, okay? Female from here, male from here. They can still interbreed, but they produce a feeble offspring, okay? A sad, sick baby, all right? Now... Uh, there will be natural selection in favor of the ability 
to choose a partner, a mate, from your own population. Okay? So if we take two guys here, okay, this guy is smart and can recognize females from his own population. All his kids are going to be healthy, right? This guy is stupid, sorry, and will and will cannot distinguish females from here from females from here. So 50% of the time, his kids will be screwed up, right? So sorry. So he's at a big disadvantage. So in other words, if there is a genetic variant in this guy that allows him to distinguish members of his own group, natural selection will favor that. Natural selection will favor mating discrimination, prezygotic isolation, actually, in order to prevent that mistake of choosing the wrong mate. We call this reinforcement. And this is, you can see this. This is kind of cool, actually. This is data from fruit fly species. Um, and so the first thing, we've got multiple species of fruit fly. Okay? And we're going to measure two things for each pair of species. So we're going to take species A and B, species C and D, species G and F, and so on and so forth. We're going to measure the genetic distance between them. The genetic distance is you can se sequence a piece of DNA from species A and species B and ask how many differences there are. And the longer they've been isolated, the longer time since their common ancestor, remember that basic change through time, the more differences there will be. So if you have a very recent common ancestor, you have a low genetic difference. If you have a rather older common ancestor, you have a high genetic distance. The genetic distance between humans and chimpanzees is very low. The genetic distance between humans and cows is high. Okay? So this is a measure of the time since common ancestry. And this is a measure of mating discrimination. Now, what does that mean? It means, essentially, in each of these cases, we've taken a female of species A, and we've given a choice between a male of species A and a male of species B. If she, get, if she chooses species A 50% of the time, she's like this guy, right? She's random. So we're going to give her a prezygotic isolation index of zero, if she gets it right every time, she always goes for the male of species A, we're going to give her a prezygotic isolation index of 1. Okay? And these are species which don't meet each other in nature. They're allopatric. Okay? And all I want you to see is as genetic distances get greater, this makes sense, right? Um, so the level of discrimination increases. That's an allopatric taxa. Now let's take sympatric. So these now are species that live in the same place. So these are species which encounter each other regularly. And look, you've got a very different pattern. Instead of a general increase like that, almost instantly, even very closely related species are very good at distinguishing. Why? They have to. Because otherwise, they're like this guy here, right? They're screwing up in terms of their reproductive choices, okay? So this is evidence, strong evidence, of natural selection in favor of mating discrimination, in favor of your particular group in sympatric populations. So this is a way in which natural selection in favor of that mating discrimination, in favor, in favor of prezygotic isolation, essentially finishes the job of speciation. Okay? It completes the acquisition of reproductive isolation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I'm going to tell you on speciation.